Mary Riley and welcome. And thank you for coming on the first night of winter. So thank you. Um, we have, I have a couple of announcements and then we'll go to the public comment. So um, there's a sign-in sheet and it would be really helpful if everybody could sign in just so. Okay, Gail will be circulating. I'm going to circulate it on a clipboard. Gail Rafferty is also on the steering committee. Matt Grady. Matt Grady, hello. I'm trying to find everybody. We have Michelle Mraz is there, and Joel is right over there. So again, thank you for coming. Um, our next meeting is December 5th, so that's the first Thursday in December. We thought we'd go all out and have a nice holiday meal. So if you have any suggestions on food, we try to have uh, gluten-free, we try to have vegetarian. Prime rib. Prime rib, we'll put that down. Let's see what we can do. Uh, do you like that? This is good. Okay, yeah, this is, my, this is from Marcos and on, in Wilson, Wilson Road, and they do a nice job, but we'll, you know, any suggestions you have, even not just the food, but, you know, any speaker, any idea, feel free to, to send any of us the email. Our emails are noted on the agenda uh, at the bottom. So we'll write it down tonight and give it to one of us. And, uh, um, yeah, okay, so I guess that's all, uh, those are the only announcements, so um, I'd like to start with the public comment. Does anyone have any comment? Hi. Hi, and if you could introduce yourself, that would sure. be great too. Could, um, hi, my name is Fifi, and Fifi Kaplan, and I recently just moved to Burlington, and I uh, moved here, I think for a lot of the reasons that many of you live here, it's a sanctuary city. It's a very humane place to live compared to the rest of the state. So um, I wanted to speak with you a little bit tonight about an issue I think that is important to me and I think perhaps would be important to you also, which is public safety. Uh, I am part of a small group of concerned citizens in Burlington and our, we are trying to get an ordinance passed through our city council that deals with the loopholes in a fair and impartial policing policy. Uh, that policy was adopted in 2017. It is a state policy, which is the floor. It's got a lot of loopholes that really it do not benefit our community. And uh, the, the loopholes, uh, for example, um, I think we're all concerned, as I said, about public safety. If we have police, uh, if our new, new Americans and our immigrants do not feel safe to call something they see in their, na their own neighborhood because they're worried about their own status, they themselves, that is a public safety issue for all of us. Uh, the second part, of course, is the profiling issue. We all are, feel that we should be equal under the law, and therefore, why should someone of color uh, be pulled over, uh, such as profiling? Um, the third thing, of course, is that it diverts so much of our tax dollars and our resources. Right now, those loopholes allow our local police force to collaborate with ICE and as well as the border police. And I'm just here to uh, begin this conversation as outreach. Um, I live in this ward, and you are the constituency of Burlington, and just so you understand that we are reaching out to all stakeholders, of course the police and the commissioners, um, and we are having meetings, individual meetings with our city councilors. Um, I have handouts for everyone if you'd like to learn more about exactly what those loopholes are, and really we just want to strengthen them and close the loopholes that would divert not only resources from our town and give us a greater sense of public safety, but also be the inclusionary town 
that our mayor speaks about and that we have become. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I have these. Anyone would like them? See me after the meeting. Anyone else? I'm teaching Suresh Garamella came to us from Purdue. 
Um, and he's been out, he's been with us since July 1st. So for a little while, he's getting out there, he's meeting with people, met with some of our counselors, including Counselor Paul, um, and just trying to connect with people. Um, yeah, and we'll no be mind. back to talk with all of you, I think, in March. So look forward to, to those connections. And that's all I have. Okay, hi everybody. I just want to say it's so great to see so many of you out. So thank you for, thanks for coming out. Um, it's great. Um, I'm from Champlain College, as I said, and I just have a couple of updates for you. First of all, we are in the middle of a presidential search. As some of you may have heard, in June, our former president, Don Lachman, uh, made the, the decision to, to leave Champlain. And at that time, um, Dr. Lori Quinn, who has been serving as our provost for the last, last six years, moved into the role of interim president. Um, and then we also brought on uh, Catherine Morgan, Dr. Catherine Morgan, as our acting provost. Catherine has um, had a couple of um, past stints at Champlain. She was a consultant for our acad academic affairs team. Um, I don't know what that is. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so she was a consultant of ours for a few years, and she also was a former Champlain College trustee. So very familiar with the college. Um, we are looking forward to an exciting uh, year ahead. Um, we do have a presidential search committee that's um, being led by Neil Lunderville. And we have a community representative on that search committee. It's uh, Tiffany Bloomley, who many of you may know. Um, we have had a number of um, opportunities for the community to provide input. And we have created a presidential prospectus that's posted on our website, if any of you would like more information on that. Um, we will be, it's an open search, so we will be bringing candidates to campus. Uh, most likely in the first few months of uh, 2020. And then the goal would be to announce a new leader in the spring time frame and have them in place to start the new academic year in 2020, 2021. Um, so that's just an update there. On the enrollment side, we are um, fairly consistent with where we've been for uh, the past many years. We're just under 2,100 traditional undergraduate students. Uh, about 110 are studying abroad this semester in Dublin, Montreal, and other partner locations. And then we have approximately 3,200 enrolled in our Champlain College online programs. Um, and then I just wanted to give a brief update on some pedestrian safety efforts because um, I know when I first came on board, that was the first question I got at the Board 6 meeting. Um, some of you may have noticed that on South Willard Street, we have built a, um, a bump out where the crosswalk is south of the main, uh, the Maple Street intersection. And we have kind of have painted triangles on either side of that bump out. So because we don't have cars on either side of the crosswalk, it's really increased visibility for both pedestrians and drivers on South Willard. Um, and then we also will have the, I see the DPW back there, and, uh, they're going to be installing the, the rapid um, rectangular flat flashing beacons in that same location. So there will be construction to put the, uh, the bases in in the next couple of weeks, and then we hope to have those in place. They're already there? When did that happen? Coming yesterday. Thanks for coming. Thanks for coming. A long time of, uh, of of waiting for those, and we're really happy to have them in place. Um, How about Maple Street, uh, the crossing on Maple Street? On Maple Street, um, what what has happened is the lighting um, has been improved, so it's now LED lighting, and that was put in in the spring. Um, so between the lighting changes and the crosswalk changes, we feel like we've made some good progress in that area. Um, I know I know pedestrian safety is a big one, and we always try and. Um, help our students understand that looking at their phones is not the thing to do when they're crossing the street, but um, but I think these steps <laughs> definitely <laughs> help in, in some of those locations. Alert the presidential search committee because he knows how to get things done. Yeah, clearly. <laughs> <literally. laughs> Thank you. Um, we also, um, St. Paul Street is now reopened and yeah. we're really excited about that. So 
Um, cheers. <laughs> On that front, our retailers that are in 194 Safe College, you some more in Perky Planet, are also very excited about that. Um, it does mean that our shuttle buses, uh, the stops for those buses are going to be moved to their, have already moved to their permanent location in front of that building and then to the side of that building. Um, and then that combined with the Maple Street construction being wrapped up means that we won't be taking so many alternate routes around campus to get from one part of campus to the other. Um, so we're happy about that as well. And um, I just want to thank those who, who made that happen. Um, as always, I post uh, updates on events and things happening around campus on Front Porch Forum. So please, um, please uh, join us for events that we do host on campus and that we make um, available to the public. And if you have any questions, I'm the liaison for neighbors, so I'm happy to um, talk to <coughs> folks at any time. Yeah? I just, uh, considering that I'm Mary, Mary Ellen Manick, I live on Kingsland Terrace. I know that Champlain College has a parking policy, and I want to know, what do we do about Champlain students that park on our street? We do not have residential parking. I'm sorry, what, what street? Kingsland Terrace. Kingsland Terrace, okay. So we have some pretty strict regulations around where students park, and we do enforce that. Um, so I'll take down your location and make sure that, um, that we pay attention to that route. Um, I know we do patrol the area. Uh, we have students that are uh, permitted. We encourage them to park in our lakeside lot and use the shuttle system. And then we have some pretty specific areas for our students and our faculty and staff to be parking. So they just shouldn't be parking. Well, I, I, um, I, I made a phone call and left a message. And I also just photographed a very big license plate on the street to send it. Yeah. So you, you know, yeah. handle this. I never heard from anybody. Okay. So let's, I'm just, let's talk yeah. afterwards, Thanks. and I can connect. Thanks. You with the right folks. Yeah. Jerry Maddock, uh, Kingsland Terrace. Uh, question about your shuttle buses. Besides the big blue one, how many other ones do you have? So we contract with GMT for the buses, um, which means we have typically two buses um, at any time going around campus, and um, they do trade out those buses sometimes. Um, but we are getting some new buses What's from the GMT. What's the capacity of the, the two that you have, the two that you use? They're fairly large buses, and, and what we've had is the school buses, the yeah. yellow school buses. Do you know buses. how many passengers those can haul? I don't know. I, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure. Did, I'm not do sure. you keep track of how many riders there are per trip from wherever they're going? We do, yeah. The, 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 um, the drivers are counting everyone that gets on and off that bus. And can we can we see that information? Because I've never seen more than five people on those buses at any time. Yeah, I'd be happy to share that with you. There are times where the ridership is really low, um, but we have to aim for the highest ridership at any given time. And so there are times, you know, depending on the class schedules, where those buses are full. And so we have to... Um, or an alternative idea would be to have a 15-passenger van that covers 75% of the passengers during the daytime. And then you could have the larger buses traveling in the morning and afternoon. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, and we have, we have um, you know, during the summer, we, we alternate with smaller buses. Um, but we have had a lot of students, especially because uh, we're trying to get them to park down in the lakeside um, location. Uh, we want to make sure that, that students have the ability to get to campus on a timely basis for their classes. Um, but I'm happy to share the ridership with you. Yeah. Same person on the park. So we'll connect. Yes. I just have a comment. Christina McCaffrey, I live here on Ledge Road and I work up at the medical center and I walk to work. Mm -hmm. So I cross both of your campuses depending on which way I'm going. And at this time of the year, I'm both coming and going in the dark. Wait a minute. So or scooters and motorized scooters seems to be a better deal right now. Yeah. And they move fast and a lot of them have no lighting on them at all. Mm. And they also aren't wearing helmets and I'm a neurosurgeon. Mm. Uh, the downside of what happens when they take a tumble. So I guess just maybe yeah. encourage them to yeah. get themselves more. Yeah, I think that's that's good feedback. We do have um, some educational programs on campus. I know I have my free white bike share helmet that I ride around Christmas with. But um, yeah, it's a good, good thing to remind students for safety purposes. Yeah. Other questions for any of us? Thank you. Okay.
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I was so excited to see this St. Paul open by the new dorm that I just drove down the whole road of St. Paul Street, admired the beauty, and realized I didn't even need to go that way. I went the wrong way, but I was so excited. That I <laughs> Um, okay, so next, let's see, sorry, we have, um, I know Jennifer Green is here, Jennifer, and Darren Springer of Burlington Electric Department Net Zero Energy Roadmap. And are you all ready for to come up here? Yes. Okay. Yes, we're about to hear 15, so we'll see you A little bit about um, our roadmap that essentially shows our trajectory or our transition uh, to net zero energy, including business as usual, so that we stay on our current path versus what our 2030 versus 2040 scenarios might look like. And then um, I'll hand it back to Darren who tell you a little bit about some of BED's new programs and incentives. Any questions on the agenda before we get started? Okay. All right. Great to be with everybody. Um, we are uh, Burlington Electric Department, your public power municipal utility. Uh, we have about 118 folks working either at 585 Pine Street or at the McNeil Woodchip Plant or some of our other generation facilities uh, around the community. Um, we have uh, not raised rates since 2009. Very proud of that even as we're becoming uh, more efficient and uh, even as we move to becoming the first city in the nation to be uh, sourcing 100% of our electricity from renewable generation in 2014. Uh, McNeil, uh, the wood chip plant in the Intervale is the largest uh, power producer in the state of Vermont now that uh, Vermont Yankee closed back in 2013. Uh, so it's an important plant uh, that we operate on behalf of Burlington Electric and also two other utilities that are joint owners with us. Uh, for those who aren't aware, we have about uh, a little under 4,000 commercial customers and over 17,000 residential customers. 60% uh, of our residential customers are renters, uh, which is uh, somewhat unique in the state of Vermont. Uh, we have a high rental population uh, for our, our service territory. Uh, we serve the entire city of Burlington as well as the airport. And uh, these are just some facts and figures uh, for us. Uh, we do have our peak uh, demand comes in the summertime, uh, so some of you may sign up for the Defeat the Peak program uh, for Burlington Electric. We'd love for you to do that uh, to help us uh, lower our demand in the summertime. And uh, I should mention our, our website, BurlingtonElectric.com, uh, all of the uh, information we're going to share tonight about the Net Zero Energy Roadmap, uh, that's available on the website, as well as a number of our incentive programs that we're going to cover as well. Um, we really have two pillars, two foundations that we're building on when we think about net zero energy and we think about our role in addressing the climate emergency. Oh, Mike, closer. Sorry. Um, one of which is we've uh, been working on energy efficiency for a number of years in the community. And Burlington Electric provides the energy efficiency services uh, for the city of Burlington. Folks have heard of Efficiency Vermont. They provide uh, similar services for the rest of the state. Uh, but Burlington Electric had been working on efficiency even before they started Efficiency Vermont. And so we are continuing to provide those services. Uh, as you can see here, we've got some really good uh, results with energy efficiency. Uh, as a community, we're using about 6% less electricity today than we were in 1989. Uh, 1990 is when we did our, our $11.3 million bond for energy efficiency, so we've seen results there. The rest of the state is up about 8.5% over that same time period, and the nation is up almost 30% in electric use over that same time period. So if the rest of the nation was on a trajectory more like Burlington, you'd be talking about a couple hundred coal plants worth of energy that wouldn't be needed uh, nationally. Um, we also are saving money uh, through efficiency. We're saving roughly 12 million annually on customer bills because of all the investments that uh, we've made and that you, our customers, have made uh, on energy efficiency. So we have a really strong track record there. This photo here, which is a little hard to see, is from our energy efficiency calendar contest. Uh, which we've renamed the Net Zero Energy Calendar Contest this year. Uh, we have all the fourth graders and all the different public schools who uh, compete to have a uh, piece of artwork uh, selected for the calendar contest. We just selected the winners uh, for the uh, current calendar contest, and we're going to be announcing those in December. And you can pick up a calendar at BED if you're ever interested. Stop by. Oh, thanks. I mentioned earlier, but uh, this is uh, about our, our other pillar, our other foundation of being 100% renewable. 
Um, that shows our renewability and our generation portfolios, those two uh, different pie graphs. Roughly speaking, we get a little more than a third of our electricity in a given year is from the McNeil plant, uh, the wood chip plant. We get roughly a third of our electricity from hydropower, and that includes uh, both large and small hydro, uh, some of which is in Vermont, uh, some of which actually comes from the Mooski One plant, which is right on the river uh, just across uh, from, from Burlington that we operate and own, as well as other Vermont-based hydro plants and other plants around uh, the region. And then a little bit less than a third of our energy is coming from wind. Uh, we have three different wind projects that we contract with, uh, two of which are in Vermont, the Sheffield and Georgia Mountain projects, and one of which is in Maine, uh, the Hancock Wind Project. And we are getting a small, and you can see it in orange here, uh, on the right, a small but growing percentage of our electricity is coming from solar in the city of Burlington. Mm. Um, so actually, in 2017, we were getting 0.3% of our electricity from solar. In this is 2018, it's up to 1.4%. So pretty significant year-over-year -year growth in solar. And I'm going to hand it to Jen to talk about the Net Zero Energy Roadmap. Great. Thanks, Derek. So Darren mentioned how Burlington in 2014 was the first city in the country to source 100% of its electricity from renewables. Very, really big achievement. And I think you know, the mayor, general manager of VED sort of regrouped and said, all right, we have sown the seeds. We have this amazing platform. What's the next sort of audacious thing that we do that puts Burlington out front and center? Let's consider a transition to net zero energy. So let's essentially sort of invite people back to the grid um, and begin to slowly transition away from fossil fuels. So let's consider um, electrifying transportation and buildings, et cetera. I want to tell you a little bit about how we plan to do that. Um, first, I'll mention, though, that in order to uh, create our roadmap to net zero energy, we knew we couldn't do it strictly alone and in-house, that we were going to need some expertise. So we put out a request for proposal, and uh, at the end of a sort of a long, deliberative exercise, um, we picked a team called Synapse Energy Economics to do our work. Um, it was an over-year process between hiring Synapse and working with them until the final, uh, the final roadmap, which was released uh, just this past September. So Synapse had a couple of tasks to do. The first thing was to analyze our business as usual. Again, if we sort of stay on this trajectory in terms of our re reduction or transition away from fossil fuels, what that would look like. And then we asked them to analyze sort of different pathways on how we could essentially um, move away from fossil fuels. So that's what I'm going to show you a little bit of now. The very first order of business was collecting up um, a clear picture of how all our energy is cu currently used in Burlington. Now you can see from the sort of um, grid line, that's transportation that's um, outside the city. Next to that is the thicker, is the, is the black piece of pie. That's transportation, sort of our customers, people moving in, in and around Burlington. Combine those two pieces of the pie and you can see the transportation is actually the majority of our energy use in Burlington. As um, BED and as a municipal utility, we knew that we didn't have firm control over that grid line. So we're taking that away for the moment. And when you do, you see that the, the two gray, which represent commercial, and residential buildings are actually the majority of the pie. So at the end of the day, the three main components that we're, we're talking about are transportation in Burlington and then commercial and residential buildings. So this is, this is what we're gonna do together, again, as a team in our transition. So we talked about Synapse Energy Economics conducting sort of business as usual. You can see that top black line. If we sort of carry on as we are, we're not going to succeed in transitioning away from fossil fuels, i.e. achieving net zero energy by 2030. If you look at that, the darker green line, the precipitous decline at the bottom, you can see this is our 2030 trajectory. It's going to be hard, and it's going to have to be fast, and we're going to have to start picking up speed pretty soon. Um, but it is possible, and it is doable. We were just curious. In the offhand chance we can't get to 2030, net zero by 2030, what would the 2040 trajectory look like? So we studied that as well. As you can see, that's a little less precipitous, but still quite ambitious. But for the purpose of this exercise, we really are focused on that 2030 goal. So not only is this roadmap to transition away from fossil fuels and invite people to use um, renewable sources of electricity, there's, this, there's a huge carbon component in this effort. 
as you can see, um, there's a lot of CO2 reduction in both the 2030 and the, uh, in the 2030 scenario. And, and uh, the, the, in the 2030 scenario. In essence, if we are successful in reaching uh, net zero by 2030, we will have reduced our greenhouse gases um, by over 50%. This is more ambitious than um, really any climate action goal that I'm, that I'm aware of in the United States. So we mentioned briefly about these pathways that we've asked and asked to analyze for us. So indeed, if we're gonna reach our goal, there are four key components, um, four key, again, sort of pieces of the pie that we're gonna have to address. 60% of our effort is gonna have to go into the electrification of buildings. So over you know, the vast majority of residential space and almost the majority of commercial space will need to be electrified eventually. And that's gonna entail through weatherization as well to help ensure that we, we can sort of drop that need for full-on electricity. The second thing we're gonna have to do, which is 20% of our sort of total um, pie, is the electrification of vehicles. Um, and Darren will tell you a little bit about what we have going on vis-a-vis -vis, um, rebates and incentives to help um, folks taste electric if you haven't had a chance yet. I'll just tell you on a personal note, I had somebody lend me his Tesla for two days. <laughs> Given the fact that we drive an old clunky Volvo, it was quite, quite an experience, and I'm sold. It's, it was almost a, it was a teaser, though. My electric vehicle will probably be a leaf or a bolt when the time comes. <laughs> sort of fun to taste the extreme, though. Um, the third thing that we'll be looking at is, is uh, district energy, and essentially taking the waste heat and using the waste heat um, from McNeil. You know this, this has been a topic of conversation for quite some time, so this is this is gonna be an important piece of us transitioning away from that fossil fuel um, element. And then lastly is this, um, the alternative transportation component. We, we, we need people to be car sharing, biking, walking, using public transit. In essence, we need to reduce our uh, vehicle miles traveled at the household level by 15% by 2030. So there, there's a role and a piece for all of us, all of us to play. Fortunately, we have um, some work underway that Darren will share with you. So, you know, a number of different solutions in the net zero energy roadmap, and I, I just want to say one thing off the top uh, before talking about the incentives, which is um, we think about a lot uh, the reducing emissions, reducing air emissions, reducing greenhouse gas emissions and pollution, the environmental benefits of what we're trying to do. I think it's also important for us to talk about the economic benefits of what we're looking at doing with some of these different uh, opportunities. And one of which is really the opportunity uh, to buy local uh, with your energy dollars. So uh, if you spend a dollar at the gas station buying gas uh, in the state of Vermont, about 80 cents of that dollar <laughs> leaves the economy of Vermont, goes outside uh, to the states or nations that are extracting those fossil fuels, getting petroleum. Uh, if you spend a dollar charging up with renewable electricity at Burlington Electric, uh, more than half that dollar stays in the Vermont economy, more than three quarters of that dollar stays in the regional economy. So I think it's important we talk about this not just as an environmental initiative, it's also an opportunity to keep more of our dollars local uh, by moving to the electric grid, moving to renewable electricity, moving away from fossil fuel. We have a number of these different incentives and, and some on the next chart and I'll talk about. Uh, we have incentives across every mode of, of electric transportation. Um, if folks are interested in an e-bike, an electric assist bike, which Jen actually uses to commute to work on a number of days, uh, and a lot of folks are using to commute around the city, uh, we have instant rebates at all of the different local bike shops uh, in town. Uh, for folks who are looking at a plug-in hybrid or an electric vehicle, uh, we offer $1,200 off the purchase of a new vehicle and $800 off the purchase of a used vehicle. Uh, we also, for our electric vehicle drivers who are purchasing a new vehicle, have an incentive for $400 to install a home charging station. And uh, we also have, this is uh, very exciting, we have an off-peak residential electric rate for EV drivers. Um, so if you sign up for our rate and you set your vehicle to charge between 10 at night and noon the next day, so you're avoiding some of the peak hours, you can charge for the equivalent of 60 cents a gallon of gas, um, which is an incredible deal. Uh, even if you're not on that rate, it's still a heck of a lot cheaper to drive electric than it is to drive with gasoline. Uh, at our public stations around town, uh, you can charge up for the equivalent of $1.46 a gallon. So there's a lot of opportunities uh, if you're thinking about driving electric. We're also working with Green Mountain Transit to bring the first two electric transit buses to the, to the fleet. Uh, they're coming soon, they're coming this year. Uh, before the end of the year, so we're excited about that. 
And uh, we also talked about weatherization and heat pumps and efficient water heating. Uh, we have incentives for all of that as well. If you're looking at getting a cold climate heat pump, uh, we have an incentive program for that to help you save on your cold climate heat pump. If you're looking at an efficient water heater, uh, we have incentives for heat pump hot water heaters. Uh, if you're looking to do weatherization, we, and in some cases, depending on who your fuel company is, maybe Vermont Gas, have incentives to help reduce the cost of weatherization in your home. Um, so really, anything you're looking to do from an energy perspective, we may have an incentive. There's uh, a few more on, on this uh, page here. We're going to bring uh, 20 new charging stations to the community over the course of the next year, uh, including uh, a number at multifamily buildings around the community so that we make sure that folks who live in a multifamily building, if they have an EV, have an opportunity to charge their vehicle. Um, we have the first two of those charging stations have gone in uh, at the corner of St. Paul and Maine. Uh, one is a public charger and one is a new charging station for the car share, uh, Nissan Leaf, which is called Sparky. Uh, so if folks want to take Sparky out for a drive and you're a car share member, uh, you can do that. Um, we also uh, are working on a number of different things on the electrification side. We have a lawnmower program, we have an electric forklift program. We're working on new incentives uh, all the time. And we really want you to think about uh, how we can help as you're, as you're looking at these different types of purchase decisions. And uh, lastly, I just want to say that um, we, all, we understand that, that incentives are important. We also understand that policy is important. So we've been working with the city council, with the mayor, on um, a number of different things related to energy efficiency for rental housing. Uh, we understand that it's not only going to be incentives, it's also going to be policy and regulation that will make a difference. And I do just want to acknowledge City Councilor Karen Paul for uh, helping to lead a resolution at the City Council on the climate emergency and supporting the net zero goal uh, across the city. It's not just a BED initiative, it's an initiative of all the departments and the mayor. And uh, we really appreciate that the City Council uh, has been supportive of this work. I think I, I can pause there and see if folks have questions that Jen and I uh, could answer. <laughs> I don't sure. own an electric vehicle yet, but this is very inspiring. I assume the city has current um, maps of where all the charging stations are. How, how would I know if I, if I bought an electric vehicle? Great, great question. So if you're looking to find out where you can charge, uh, you can go to burlingtonelectric.com slash EV. And we have on there not only a list of our incentives, but also a map of the different charging stations around the community. Great. Yes. I bought an electric car a year ago, August. And I think I missed your open window because at that point there were no incentives for used cars. Mm -hmm. And then I installed a level two charger in my house, but it wasn't one of the two that you support. Uh. So I got no benefit from charging. So what can you do for me as a used electric car owner who charges a, a level two at home? What, what kind of charging station do you have? A juice box. Okay, okay. So this is one of the challenges with our incentive programs is we have to be able to prove to the state that anything we offer essentially helped cause somebody to do something. And so we can't always take credit for things that happen kind of without our own intervention. Um, that said, there is one thing that we're working on. I don't know if it'll be helpful to you or not because you have a charging station, but we recognize that some folks either don't have the right charging station or may not have a charging station at all, maybe plugging into the wall. Um, By the with, right charging station, one. do you mean your type of charging yeah, station? Yeah, and, and the reason we have a charging station requirement is we have a Wi-Fi connection with the charging station so we can get the data that shows that you're charging at the right times of day. Um, so not all of the different stations have that connectivity with us. That's been the challenge. Um, we're more than willing to work with anybody who has that. Um, we are working on getting some smart charging cords um, from a company called Smart uh, ENIT out in California. They're trying to get them UL tested and listed for sale. Uh, we've promised that when they have them, we're going to bring a bunch of them in and lend them to our customers for free uh, for folks who haven't been able to get on the EV rate and want to. So if you wanted to uh, give us a call, we could see if you would be eligible to get one of those cords and maybe be able to get on the rate that way, even though the charging station is not the right station. Now, can I retroactively apply for the $800 rebate for a used electric vehicle? I wish I could do that, uh, but we're not allowed to by state regulation. Yeah, because when we offer the program, we have to be able to show that we, we made an addition to the state's uh, kind of actions on, on energy, and so we never were able to go retroactive, unfortunately. And the thing about that at, is as more and more electric vehicles enter the market, the market for used vehicles is going to increase. So I think 
-hmm. that has to yeah. be incentivized because you shouldn't be penalized for owning a used electric vehicle. I couldn't agree more. And that's why we launched, you know, it was the first time that we've ever done it, uh, an $800 rebate on the, the used EVs, the used plugins, uh, which is now active as of September. So I know we missed you, but uh, for folks who are looking at a used vehicle, uh, they're eligible for that rebate. And uh, if we can help you with the charging cord, uh, maybe we can get you on the EV rate and at least save you some money that way. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, sir. So <laughs> this is for Jennifer and probably for Karen. I know this is a really admirable goal. Um, there seems, though, to be a disconnect between this and what I believe is the city's position that residential only parking on the hill should be eliminated. Because when that's eliminated, you're going to push more cars up onto the hill to park. So that seems to be, on the one hand, you're going to encourage cars to come up to the hill. On the other hand, you're encouraging zero net emissions. So I just pose one wonder whether you've talked to um, DPW about that. Yeah, um, not about that specific issue, but we are in constant communication around sort of parking, um, this idea of sort of eliminating the minimum parking requirements, because we know the left hand has to talk to the right. I I'll look into that issue specifically. I'm actually not aware of that change up on the hill. Well, it's, it's not happened yet, but it's been proposed mm -hmm. and bandied about for a couple of years. Yeah, well, I appreciate you bringing that up. And Karen, do you want to say anything about that or? Um, other than just, I sort of, I don't want to. There are, there are no plans to eliminate resident-only parking. There are no plans. That has been discussed. We've had many discussions about that. It was about, I don't know, three years ago, and the decision was made that there would be no eliminating resident-only parking. There have been changes to new, to, to streets that, now want resident only parking but there have been no changes to streets that currently have resident only parking well, i'll email you my last correspondence with chapin okay <laughs> yeah please so i drive a hybrid an older one um but i'm curious about the public transit because um i've lived in bigger cities like mexico city and I did not drive my vehicle in Mexico City. I parked it and left it because I knew that the buses came so frequently that I would never have more than a 10 or 15 minute wait. And my impression is that GMT actually has recently cut back on the frequency of buses. And that's the wrong direction to go if we want to encourage people to leave their vehicles. I, I walk, I'm another UVMer. So I walked campus and I count the number of single occupant vehicles that pass me just on Shelburne Road as I walk to work. And it's, it's got to be 90% of them have a single, have the driver and that's it. And we've got to do better about getting functional public transit. Yeah, only I couldn't agree with you more. I mean, this is a, this is a challenge for, absolutely. And so I think you know, BED is committed to working on that 15% of the pie, and I think we're going to have to do it together. You know, it's, it is putting pressure on Green Mountain to the, to the extent that we can. It's recognizing that we have a robust car share network here, unlike other small cities that have not been able to pull that off. Um, we do have a bike walk master plan that I think we should help ensure sort of moves to fruition um, in a strategic way. Um, and I, I just I agree with you. It's it's a challenge. Um, really happy that we are contributing to the electric buses that are that are joining the fray. So that that is helpful. But no, I, I hear your frustration, and um, many of us feel it too. Yeah. Um, I'd just like to dovetail on what she, she just said because, to me, I being a newbie here, I moved here thinking, I, I don't own a car. I just walk and bike and use public transportation. And I'm actually so dismayed by the lack of use by the general public. First of all, the buses are rarely filled, but it's also the fact that this is Vermont. There's supposed to be this ethos. There's supposed to be this consciousness. And I'm, quite, I'm not quite sure I agree about the scheduling, although it's actually gotten better now that most buses come every 20 minutes as opposed to 30. 
They're still not on time, but it's a, a shorter waiting period. But I am just, I, I actually cannot quite believe that Vermonters feel that it is a right for that to drive. I, I don't understand why there isn't more uh, about people utilizing the public uh, transportation system. And you're right, it's gotta be, uh, it's gotta be tenable for both parties. But I see, um, I, I was actually very shocked, and this is why I don't consider this place a city, because if you had to depend upon it, you can't get to work or where you need to go. Thank you for sharing that. I appreciate that. Yeah, hi, Mark. Uh, hi. What, what is the hold up for McNeil plant uh, using uh, that spare electric, uh, that spare heat? We've talked about it for years and years and years. Yep, yeah, it, it was uh, in the original permit for the plant uh, back in 1984. So we've been talking about it for a very long time. Um, the challenge, and we're working on it actively, and I hope to have more to share on that in the near future. Uh, the challenge is essentially the cost of getting the infrastructure in place from McNeil uh, up to the potential customers and stakeholders who've been working with us, whether it's uh, UVM Medical Center or, or some UVM buildings or other buildings that could be involved. Um, so we're looking at different options that would keep the cost of that as reasonable as possible, uh, maximize the amount of uh, extra heat essentially that we could get from the McNeil plant, and, uh, and move that to, to get it moving. I mean, we really just need to get a first step uh, of infrastructure in place from McNeil up, up the hill, up to some customers, and we'd be able to expand that over time. Uh, it's an exciting concept. It potentially is the single biggest emissions reduction project we could undertake in Burlington. So it's, it's been a high priority for us, and we hope to have more to share soon. Yeah. Follow on on McNeil. Uh, I would encourage you to look at the power plant in Singapore for best practices. Are you aware of what they're doing? Uh, not in Singapore, no. Yeah, they, they, they burn trash. The average lifespan of a candy bar wrapper is less than one day in Singapore. Hmm. Uh, they get heat out of it. They get electricity out of it. The stack is emitting gases that are cleaner than the, the breathable atmosphere at the bottom. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it's a really a very integrated Plant, I would encourage you just to look at best practices from their plant. Thank you. Appreciate it. Yes. Uh, two questions. questions. Um, will the locomotive for the new passenger train be electric or will it be diesel? And the second question is, you mentioned earlier on that you cover the airport. Do any of your figures here, including CO2 emissions and, and the use of fossil fuels, include the airport? So we, we do include the airport in terms of the use of energy in the facilities. Um, the uh, emissions from essentially all uh, aviation fuels, not just at Burlington Airport, but statewide, all the different uh, aviation fuels in the most recent Vermont data that I've seen are about 1% of the total statewide emissions. Um, but we didn't include air travel as part of the net zero energy goal. There's some things I'm aware of that are interesting and exciting in the area of reducing emissions in air travel. So it's definitely an area that I know is getting attention not just in Vermont, but uh, nationally and globally. And I've, I've visited with uh, Beta Technologies at the airport who's working on electric uh, aviation technology that's quite exciting. But uh, for the net zero energy goal, we were looking to tackle the two biggest sectors of emissions uh, in Burlington and in Vermont, which is the heating and the ground transportation. So. That's what this analysis uh, looks at. I don't have any information on the rail. I don't know if Jeff, you've heard anything about no, that. but good to check up on. Yeah. Um, yes? This plan calls for a lot more electricity. Where does that come from? Yes. Um, yes. And the renewable energy. That's right, that's right. So if we were to reach the goal here in terms of reducing significantly the amount of fossil fuel we're using for heating and transportation, uh, we would be looking at potentially using up to 65% more renewable electricity. Um, so what we're doing right now is uh, we're working on a state plan that we do every few years called the Integrated Resource Plan, IRP. Uh, we're going to file that in 2020, and we're looking at not just where would we be getting all the additional renewable energy, uh, but also what types of upgrades would we need on our system, and how can we make those in a cost-effective way if we move in this direction, uh, and in a way that still benefits our customers. Over the next several years, we likely have uh, room on our system to accommodate additional energy use from electric vehicles and coal climate heat pumps, but over a 10-year window, if we were to achieve this goal, uh, we would have upgrades that we would need to make. So we're studying that, and we'll have a plan uh, related to that uh, in 2020. Okay, go a, a lot of utilities are, I think, are required to, to
deliver this service for the minimum. Mm -hmm. So are we required to do that or can we pay more in order to achieve these goals? So in Vermont, um, we do have least cost planning principles, but they include uh, environmental costs. So we've never so had we a... take into account the externalized costs? Yes, yes. Our, our Public Utility Commission has uh, always accounted for those costs. So we're not required to go out and buy the cheapest uh, energy if it's fossil fuel, whereas you might get a slightly more expensive uh, unit of energy potentially if it was renewable and not be able to figure in those costs. That's not the way the Vermont model works. Um, I think what we found is that you're able to move in the direction that we're moving and still be uh, you know, responsible financially as well. Karen, we have time for two more questions, maybe this gentleman and then Michelle, and then we'll wrap it up. would be great. Thank you. As uh, two comments, one was about burning trash. I, I agree with that. And other places to look at is Denmark and Switzerland. Mm -hmm. and, it, and another advantage to burning trash is you don't drive the trash out, mm -hmm. out, outside of burning trash. So you can actually, there's, there's small uh, units that, that is fairly locally. For example, right in Zurich, this happens in the middle of the city. Mm -hmm. And uh, Switzerland is known for not being a dirty place. So I think the technology is established. I really would encourage you to look into it. Um, but I found this discouraging is that that part that you said is not driven with the cars that are coming in, mm -hmm. that you're not accounting for, which I understand yeah. why, but I also think that um, there should be uh, significant planning a among zoning and other things because I think ultimately you do want to, yeah. you will have a problem with with cars, I think from a scalability yeah. issue and so on. And I think there are opportunities to change this now. For one example for me is the high school. I don't understand why we have more parking there. Do we really want to encourage students to drive there? And so I don't know what role you can play in that. But I, I think uh, all these incentives on the alternative mode of transportation have been strong. No, I, I appreciate the point. And um, in terms of transportation, vehicle miles traveled into Burlington from folks who are coming from outside, whether it's commuters, visitors, tourists. Um, we didn't account for it directly, although we modeled it. We didn't account for it directly because in many cases, we can't offer those customers an incentive. It's another utility that will. Uh, but I agree with you that it's an important segment of, of our work, and we want to affect uh, that aspect of transportation as well. Uh, for example, if we're putting charging stations in the right places and somebody's driving in, they can potentially have an electric vehicle and drive to work and charge here in Burlington. Uh, we know transit, community planning, all of those are, are regional uh, in nature and um, we are working on all of that. So I definitely appreciate the point. We agree with you that the regional transportation system is important. Uh, we just, for, for purposes of this analysis, tried to focus on the, the vehicle miles traveled of Burlington residents, but it's a good point. Okay, really quick, the 1.4% of the energy supply by source is the solar. I'm just wondering, is that the residential panels or is there some, is there a solar farm in Burlington I don't know about? Yeah, it's, it's both. Um, ah. So it's, it's all the different residential systems uh, that you see. Uh, we also have several different uh, systems that are a little larger. Uh, we have a system on our roof at Pine Street. Uh, DPW has one as well. Um, and there's actually a, uh, a solar, a 2.5 megawatt solar facility uh, in the new north end in Burlington and a 500 kilowatt solar facility at the airport on the uh, roof of the garage. So we have some larger, larger for us, not large by national standards, uh, solar. And we actually, uh, in 2018, or, or it may have been this year, 2019, we were ranked by Environment America as being the number one community for solar per capita uh, in New England and number four in the country. And I think we have the potential to jump to number two uh, sometime in the near future with all the growth in solar. So uh, per capita basis, Burlington is doing really well with solar. So thank you all very much. Thank you. I just want to say I was inspired the first time I saw someone who Riding an electric vehicle several years ago. So, of course, that person was Jennifer. All right, we're going to, uh, well, one thing too, if there's a clipboard circulating and you haven't signed in, just so see where that clipboard got to. Oh yeah, great. Just um, just move it to one of the tables. If you don't mind, we'll keep it circulating. All right, we're going to move on to Burlington Tenants Union, and uh, Christy Delphi is coming up as along with maybe some of her colleagues, and they've got some material to pass out as well that they're passing out. Is that 
Other than the fact that I've got a, a deep voice to begin with, I know how to use a microphone. Uh, my name is Christy Delphia, and we are from uh, the Burlington Times Union, which is a newly formed union in Burlington for renters. We are fighting for landlord rights, uh, rights for tenants against landlords, uh, democratized housing, which means we do not want renters of low income to be segregated from the richer neighborhoods. Everybody should be included everywhere. We also are fighting for better housing as far as repairs by landlords. We are finding that a lot of tenants right now are fighting with their landlords over things not being repaired buildings not being kept up to code. Also, evictions, because of tenants complaining to code enforcement, are being unfairly evicted from properties for complaining about not having their apartments repaired. We just recently had a summit for renters this past Sunday at the library because Mayor Weinberger did not mention renters at all in his housing summit. The biggest thing that we found is the code enforcement complaints by tenants because landlords just aren't, aren't keeping up their properties. And it's a, it's a very, it's a hard fight for us. A low income people are being forced out of Burlington. The prices for Section 8 will only pay 1465 for a two bedroom for low income people. We are finding that landlords are now raising those prices of rent high enough so that people cannot afford to live in Burlington or the Burlington area. They're being forced to the outlying areas. And most people don't have cars, they rely on public transit. And 60% of Burlington is renters. And we're not, our voices are not being heard as of right now. And that's a very large problem. Um, sure. This is Chris. Yeah. Hi, my name is Chris. Um, and I recently you know, joined the Burlington Ten Tenants Union. Um, like Chrissy was saying, it's a newly formed um, union. But uh, I have, I'm just giving a little bit of background on my, my own personal experiences. Um, so, on one hand, um, my wife Megan and um, and I lived with my wife Megan and, and daughter Dylan um, at uh, Decker Towers actually. Um, so this is our ward, uh, and um, and we're the kind of we're I mean we're we're in a, in an in kind situation where we're able to um, um, you know in exchange for housing there where you know we provide certain services where the the overnight um, on-call resident managers. And so I think that this is kind of um, illustrative of, of how how the high housing costs have affected, um, you know, uh, are affecting uh, families in, uh, in Burlington. We could not really, we could not afford to live in Burlington. Um, what w wasn't up for the situation that we have. Um, you know, it's basically we're working, you know, two jobs, working all around um, the clock. I, I work, you know, full-time job in uh, social services, uh, working with uh, people who are experiencing or uh, um, agencies and, and service providers that are, are serving people who are experiencing homelessness in the community and, uh, and coordinating, you know, um, services for them and hopefully housing. Part of my experience that also brings me to the tenant union is I've been doing this work in Burlington for you know about four about four years probably, and and it struck me that we're we're in always having to kind of prioritize resources, very scarce resources that we have um, for those who are deemed to be the most needy um, uh, of people who are experiencing homelessness in, in, in the community, and you know we do as much as we can to house people, um, connect them with with. Uh, um, uh, whatever affordable housing is, is available or Section 8 vouchers or, or whatever. 
there's just not enough to go around. And so I think that um, one of the things that the tenants union is also you know, very concerned with is uh, the precariousness of housing that leads people also, um, puts people at risk of homelessness or even leads them into homelessness. And we, we, we do have an enduring kind of chronic um, homeless, uh, 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 you know, homelessness problem in Burlington that really has not been even, you know, with all the um, you know, whatever kind of inclusionary zoning housing we can do or, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, any kind of developments that we, you know, we have, we've seen come online, we still don't see the, our, our numbers really significantly go down. So I think that um, for me, homelessness, um, uh, um, you know, precariousness of housing uh, is really uh, one of the prime mo motivators that's bringing me to the tenants union. And, uh, and my perspective is that I think that, you know, I'm inspired by a group of uh, tenants who are really kind of organizing um, to say that, yeah, we, I mean, we're, we're really wanting the, 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 in the interest of renters and tenants in Burlington to really be represented and to be heard. So what we're aiming to do in the coming years is to change housing for renters. Some of the things that we need to have passed by local government is uh, rent caps, not rent control. Rent control is a band-aid. Rent caps need to be placed because the amount of space in these apartments as opposed to what they're being charged for is just totally inadequate and it's, it's not helping anybody out. Um, other than and better tenants' rights because tenants actually have very few rights. Landlords have all the rights. And we are finding that a lot of tenants do not know they have rights against their landlords. They do not know where to go to find out their rights. Other issues are lawyers for those who are facing evictions, whether they be just cause or no cause. And especially right now, we're finding a lot of our tenants are dealing with no cause evictions. And unfortunately, there are no lawyers for us to use. We're basically left to do it ourselves. And if we have to go pro se, which means, you know, we have to figure out this stuff on our own, there's not really any information out there for us to properly use to be able to fight these things in court because you can never unless you have proof that it's a retaliation eviction a no cause eviction basically means you're going to be kicked out of your home and become homeless um airbnbs we have had a lot of issues with those as well they take out over 270 units a year for rental because it allows the homeowner to rent out their space to people that don't live here year round. And that's a big problem for renters in Burlington. Um, more for affordable housing. They are proposing to build two more hotels in the middle of Burlington. We don't need the hotels. We've, we've had enough with hotels being built. Hotels being built means more <coughs> traffic into the city from cars, from people that are coming from out of state to rent those rooms. And it's not, it's taking away the availability of building housing that we des desperately need in the city right now. Um, and the inclusionary zoning issues that we've been facing is the most recent one is back at the beginning of the summer, they added landlords being able to charge their tenants for parking on top of the already high rents. That's a problem. They can't, we can just barely afford housing now. And then to add that in on top of it is it's making a very horrible situation. The next inclusionary zoning meeting we're going to have or the proposals that have been brought up is that they want to segregate housing. It's already segregated enough. That's what we need to stop. We don't want to be separated from those who have money and need to be living in outerlying areas of the city because the 40% of property owners and landlords have the majority votes over what happens in Burlington when Burlington is 60% renters. So we need to change that as well to make it fair for everybody to live here. 
So those are the things that we're we're open to change, and we need to get code enforcement to actually do their jobs. We have, uh, in my case, I am right now waiting for a verdict from the Housing Board of Review because we were dealing with code enforcement for the last six months, and they have not forced this landlord that we are running from to fix his property. They cover things up, and code enforcement says, okay, see, we can't see it anymore if this passes. <clears throat> this is a very large issue. They're charging $1,600 <coughs> and up for two-bedroom apartments, and things are just falling apart and not getting fixed. So these are the things that we hope to change in the future. And any help that we can get from regular homeowners as opposed to landlords, that would be helpful too. Thank you. Yeah, we have time for questions. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, the uh, looking at the municipal charter for CEDAW, and it really talks about development, 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 development. Would you? Does it make sense uh, from your point of view to get behind a movement to change the uh, the mandate for CEDAW to include truly affordable housing? Yes, that's in organizing with with us right now. We're just starting out, so we're still trying to figure out how we're going to organize around going to the state house and fighting more. We have to build up more people to join us, and then we're going to be going after all of that kind of stuff. We hope to go to the state house as well with some of these issues. Maybe this is a question for Karen as well. Uh, it's around the Airbnb question, especially with the growth of City Place and then uh, the other new units. What's the city's position in trying to deal with this uh, difficult issue of Airbnb and keeping the market open for renters? Well, I mean, it's a complicated issue and I don't want to take time away from, um, from, from you being able to answer other questions, but the, um, you know, it, it's, a, it's a challenge with Airbnb because there are some people who rent out a room um, and don't do it all the time, but rent out a room, and that, that income allows them to stay in their home. And we don't want to push people out of their homes. Um, there are some people, like you had just said, that are really not living in the home, but are renting it. And that is a way of basically using it as a source of revenue. Um, that could otherwise have full-time full -time tenants who live here. Um, and that's what we're trying to find a way of being able to um, curtail. Um, and it's with the ordinance committee, and that is what we are trying to do. So that is certainly, you make a very good point. Um, you know, we, we, as I say, we don't want it. A lot of the people that are, that are renting a room um, and not, this is, you know, this is not all, all of the people that are doing this. Many of the people that are doing that are older. And without that, they would not be able to stay in their home. So, um, but anyway, I hope that answers your question. We're just about at time, um, Christine and Chris, but thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks you for have coming. a chance to pass out. on now to DPW and they've also set up a lot of uh, visuals for folks and the tables in the back so you can check that out on the way out. Um, we have Megan and who else is? My, my esteemed colleagues are just going to be available for answering Megan questions. Megan and her esteemed colleagues <laughs> on the side. We have, we have Jenna, we have Jenna, we have Jenna Olson who's our water quality uh, program. Our water resources uh, programs and policy manager and then Jess Lavalette, who is responsible for sending you your water sewer stormwater bill every single month. Uh, you know that? Jess. Yes, me. You're brave coming out. I know. Right? <laughs> Hi, folks. So we're handing out handing out copies of the presentation. Going to have you guys follow along with me. So this 
we're, we're on, you're the first stop on our NPA tour. We did a um, public meeting, open house on October 29th. A lot of people came, it was great. We had food, we had a door prize, um, and I don't know if any of you were able to attend, but it was, it was a really great turnout. And the reason we're doing this is we are taking a really hard look at our rates and the affordability. It was, it's kind of good to follow up um, after the Burlington Tenants Union because we know that there are some affordability issues in Burlington and we want to make sure that as we progress with figuring out how much money we need to sustainably steward our water resources infrastructure that we're aware of that and that we're making changes as necessary to make sure that people aren't having to choose between clean water and medicine or food or something like that. So I want to spend a little bit of time just reminding folks of the services that Burlington Water Resources provides. I'm the division director, Megan Moyer. Um, I've been with DPW and, and water resources since 2009 when I started as the stormwater program coordinator and three years ago I'm now in charge of all three waters, which is quite the challenge and very exciting every day. So we're going to talk a little bit about what it is we do and then talk about why we're doing this rate study, look at the existing rates, and then also talk to you and hopefully get your input on some of the suites of options that we're going to be looking at as part of the affordability study. So I'm now on page three, the core values. We believe that access to clean water is a human right. Um, it's something that the UN talks about. Um, we're very lucky in the United States that we have clean water, but it's something that we shouldn't take for granted. And so when we think about how we provide access to clean water, we have to make sure in 24 seven, 365 days a year, that is our main focus, our main mission. But we have to make sure that we're collecting enough money. And so part of this study is to actually look at all of the things we do, and are we collecting enough money to sustainably steward our infrastructure? Um, you know we've been starting to rip up streets and rebuild water mains and whatnot. Uh, how much of that do we need to continue to do to stay on a trajectory where we are taking care of our existing infrastructure, as well as planning for the construction of and investment in new things that we may need to do in order to you know, protect the lake? But we're worried that when we start talking about how much it may cost, to do what we need to do that we're gonna bump up against these affordability issues. So they're a little bit at loggerheads. So moving on, just an overview of water resources. Um, not that many people always think about uh, how the city finances work, but water resources, it is a utility like, like BED. When you pay money to uh, in your water sewer stormwater bill, that goes into a separate pot of money. We do not get supported by the property taxes. That money does not co-mingle. Uh, so that, that stormwater dollar that you spend goes directly to stormwater services. The wastewater dollar you spend gets sequestered and goes to uh, wastewater services, and the water goes to the drinking water. We serve about 10,000 connections and all of the residents of uh, Burlington, as well as a small portion of um, Colchester as far as providing drinking water. And we currently have about 43 full-time staff. Um, in total, our budget is about almost uh, $17.5 million um, at this point for FY20. Uh, page five, Water Enterprise Fund Overview. I'm not going to go through all of our assets. I've listed them there so you can know all of the things that we have to take care of, how many miles of pipe. Um, but the main function that the water enterprise or the water utility provides is drinking water. When you turn on that tap, under most good days, you expect to see clean good water that you can drink, use for bathing, use for cooking. We also do provide fire protection. So all of the hydrants, all of the sprinkler systems, we maintain enough pressure and we pump enough pressure from the lake that if a huge fire broke out, you, if the firefighters know that there's enough flow to be able to put enough water on, on any sort of structure. Uh, moving on to wastewater. The main function of wastewater, you know, we call it wastewater, but the, in, the, in the industry, we're now thinking more about water recovery. That's what wastewater treatment is. It's taking the clean water that you put through your body or the clean water that's gone down the drain and it's stripping out all the pollutants that you or somebody has contaminated it with um, from the sewage or from the combined sewer storm water and getting as much of those pollutants out so that we can return it back to the hydrologic cycle, the lake, which is also where we take our drinking water out. So it really is they really are water recovery facilities. Um, our wastewater treatments plants, they are old. They do sometimes have problems. Um, in this most recent storm event, we did successfully process 34 million gallons of 
combined sewer. We did have some combined sewer overflows, which a large portion of Vermont also did, but the plant itself um, did really well. And it was interesting because that storm event, 3.52 inches in 14 hours, we processed almost as much water as we did in Hurricane Irene, which was over a multi-day period. Uh -huh. So through the dedication of our staff, we were working around the clock, making sure things were working, um, we were able to get through that. On the stormwater side, stormwater is sort of the baby of the water family, right? Uh, water's been around since 1867, wastewater since about the 1950s, which is baffling to me that we were dumping sewage into the lake until 1950s, but so be it. Stormwater came around uh, in Burlington in 2009 when we realized, okay, stormwater's cleaner than wastewater, but over the time, the fact that there's so much rain and there's, I mean, anybody can look at the roadways and see what's in it and see that it is truly not clean. And so over time, all of those pollutants in stormwater cause problems. And so the chief function of the stormwater program is to get as many of those pollutants out as possible. And then on the combined sewer side, and I've been here talking occasionally about the combined sewer system, I'm not going to get into it, but could take questions later. Um, our chief focus is how do we get as much water out of the combined sewer system so that it doesn't cause those combined sewer overflows that we do still suffer from. Um, so that's sort of our two, two tackle, depending on where you are in the city, we're either going to be trying to filter the stormwater and or get rid of it. Um, but if you're in the combined sewer system, we're trying to just either hold on to the water or get it to go back into the ground so that it doesn't enter the pipe and cause those overflows. Everybody with me so far? So the good news is we've been doing better. Um, if you look at this capital reinvestment effort graph, you can see that for a long time, FY13, 14, 15, we really weren't doing a great job of investing in our existing infrastructure. Things were breaking. We, we didn't have the money to do it. and we. With the success of voters, uh, the council, the mayor have been starting, I would say starting to make the levels of investment that we need to in order to keep our infrastructure working. Um, this is not reflective of the things that I think we will ultimately have to do, the new stuff, the new stormwater infrastructure, the new wastewater treatment processes. This is about keeping things working as they are and not backsliding. Um, so we've been doing a, a much better job of that. We've been leveraging low interest loans when we can. The state revolving fund program gives us 2% loans. We often get loan subsidy. Uh, we just recently, Jenna was responsible for getting a million dollar grant to do combined sewer um, stormwater reduction, largely in this area because this is the area right here that feeds the Pine Barge Canal so, uh, CSO that goes off so frequently. So. Um, I think Jenna had put out a, a posting, we're gonna be doing lots of little soil testing all throughout this whole area. Um, I don't know if there's something posted online, Facebook. The Front Forum post, actually, Eleni Churchill is one of our project managers for RPC. She helped us secure that grant. Um, that's for um, basically identification of long-term uh, stormwater projects so that we can better integrate with paving and traffic calming and things like that. Yeah, we're, try, we're, trying to figure, we're trying to figure out where, where the soils may exist that we could actually get the water to go back in the ground because that's the absolute best thing that you can do um, when you're trying to deal with stormwater in a combined sewer system. Before I move on, even though we have these separate buckets, water, wastewater, stormwater, we are one water. I think we're unique um, for at least some places in the United States in which the, the drinking water people report to the same person that the wastewater people do, that the stormwater do. So when we make, when we do planning, when we're making decisions, we're thinking about how the impact would be to all of the waters. There's also some cost savings there, right? We don't send you a separate wastewater bill and a separate stormwater bill. Um, a lot of our administrative services are also kind of in a holistic one water way. So I think that's a benefit to how we are structured. Moving on to rate pressures. There's, there's some big line items. When we look at the, when we look at the budget for uh, these funds, personnel-related costs are always up there. Our number of people in healthcare, so on and so forth. We are unfortunately still paying the debt service from the 1990 wastewater upgrade um, to the tune of about a million dollars a year. That is on our books for many more years. Um, there's various electricity. I'm sharing these with you because just there's costs that are there and they're not fixed. They go up every year, just like your bills, your gas bills, your electric bills, your your gasoline. There's always these things that are going up. And so when I start looking at the rate pressures, um, I start projecting what these rate increases may be, even just on a as things are now. And then we start to talk about enhancements. Um, that's where we kind of landed 
with the council, we move on to page 11, impetus for a rate and affordability study. The council has been great in hearing what our needs assessments are and supporting them and supporting these small incremental rate increases, usually between somewhere two to four, four and a half percent. Um, but they know and we know that we can't keep doing that um, without really looking at our rates and making sure that they're affordable. And so when we last came to them, um, I believe requesting both for the bond, the wastewater bond, as well as for some staffing upgrades, we came to an agreement that we needed to do this rate study. And so we needed to look at alternative revenue sources. We need to make sure there's not other things out there that we could be charging for. You know, PED has been able to not have a rate increase for a fairly long time, largely because they have a very diverse portfolio of revenue where our primary revenue is just charging you guys. <laughs> um, we wanted to look at alternative rate structures to figure out how to maybe progressively price these tiers to preserve that essential access to clean water. We're not talking about making water cheaper for everybody all the way up. If you're gonna be a water hog, we're not just gonna let you waste that water, but that initial part of water that you need to bathe, drink, so on and so forth, should that be priced in a different way? Um, and then when and where those rate structures don't help certain people, certain low income people, people who are well below the federal poverty limit, are there other ways that we could offer assistance uh, through discounts and so on and so forth? Um, as part of that process, naturally, we need to do a lot of stakeholder engagement. That's why we're here. That's why we're going to continue to come back as we, as we move through our analyses. So moving on to the rate study goals, this page, you know, it's, it's based on a, three main things. We want to make sure that we are looking at all of the things that we provide and that we're fully recovering those costs. People shouldn't, particularly folks or customers who are getting something special, such as if they are discharging higher strength waste um, than a typical residential customer, or they're getting, you know, say, private fire protection. Should Residential users shouldn't necessarily be paying for a big building to be getting this, in theory, special service. So we need to make sure that the costs are equitably being recovered. And then we need to make sure that there are these wraparound policies, whether it's the rate structure or affordability discounts, to make sure that everybody really does have access to um, to clean water and to making sure that um, making sure that nobody's having to choose, like I said, between you know food um, and and being able to have water for their family. Without looking at this page, how much do you know? How much you pay for your water? What's your water bill? It's around sixty to seventy-five. Okay. Anybody else know what they pay? Under thirty. Under thirty. Great. So, so the, tip, the typical bill, so the typical amount of water used by a single family home is about 400, 400 cubic feet. Uh, 100 cubic feet, so that's a 10 by 10 room with a foot deep of water, um, is about 748 gallons. So you can kind of do the math of how much, how much 400 cubic feet is. Um, and the typical, typical customer pays just under $50 right now which we had one person come up at the, at the public meeting and say, charge me more. I was like, you got no. Um, the point is, it, 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 we do get a lot of value. We believe you get a lot of value for the service. You know, one gallon, uh, a gallon of water out of your tap is just over a half of a cent. Um, I think I did some other math. You know, a 10 minute shower costs you about 37 cents. Um, when you look at what you pay for your cable bill, for your cell phone bill, for your, your BED bill, and you're getting three services, right, for the price of one thing, you get three, um, it, it really is quite a value, and, and across the nation, I think utilities are struggling with the fact that folks don't remember how important this essential service is and, and, and what does it really cost. So I'm almost done so that you guys can answer lots of ask lots of questions. So some of the priority options that we're considering as far as these, um, these fees uh, and, and rates. We talked about recovering the cost and stabilizing revenue, so page 14. Um, we're looking at a number of different fees. Most of these, I would actually say almost all of them, do not apply to residential users, um, except for the standalone fixed, cheap, uh, fixed charge by meter size. That first one is, is about the fact that the vast majority of our costs are fixed. If I had a day where nobody used the water, nobody flushed their toilet, most of the pipes, 
the infrastructure, my people all still have to be here. So a large proportion of our budget is, is a fixed cost. And so a lot of utilities are starting to add a small fixed charge. I believe, I don't know if BED has a, an admin charge, but like you'll often see it as an admin charge. Um, and we're looking at doing that kind of to stabilize our revenue stream so that when we have when we have one of these these years where people don't actually use a lot of water, like that, that's really hard for our budget because our costs are all the same, but then we are not taking in as much. Most of the other fees, um, such as a connection charge, that would be if somebody built a new building or a new home. We do extensive review. We have engineers, planners, everybody taking a look at this to make sure it's being done appropriately and we're not recovering those charges right now. Uh, the fire protection charge I mentioned, we're looking at whether or not we should be charging somebody who has a standalone sprinkler system some modest amount because they are getting the benefit of all of the extra pumping capacity that we have um, and, and various other ones. I think the ones that you'll be most interested in are the affordability enhancements. So right now we charge everybody the same all of the time, doesn't matter how much you use, $4.44 per 100 cubic feet for water. We are looking at coming up with an inclining block rate where that initial tier, maybe it's 400, maybe it's 350, we haven't decided, but that initial everybody needs that amount of water would be cheaper for single family residentials. Um, and then if you use more than that, you certainly would be charged sort of at a premium rate because you're probably using a little bit more water than you should. We're trying to dial in into how we'll deal with multifamily residentials because they often have one, um, one meter. And so it wouldn't really work to charge them with this single family rate, but we're hoping to come up with something that might be kind of blended in between the two. And then commercial folks, and I don't know if there's anybody here who owns a business, commercial folks you know, likely would pay at a slightly higher rate because that is not essential life access water. That is water that you're using as part of your business. Um, and you know, it'll be interesting to have the discussions with businesses about how they feel about that. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> I mean, the only way to ensure access to clean water for, you know, users, residential users for that, that life bit is we are going to have to balance the cost. So it is going to be a discussion that we're going to have to have. Um, and then flipping on to the very last one, I just wanted to give you the sort of full suite of affordability programs that we're looking at. Um, there's many more things. There's education. There's plumbing assistance. I think the Burlington Tenants folks, we'd like to meet with them because we think there may be utility, even if we can't provide a direct discount to renters, can we figure out some way to make sure that their buildings that they live in are not using more water, right? If you have a leaky toilet, that can cost you hundreds of dollars, um, and then that's not being rolled into their rent rate somehow. Now, figuring that out is gonna be very difficult, and it's possible that that might be a phase two. We're gonna try to not let the, um, perfect be the enemy of the good, right? If we can come up with some affordability programs to help people who are lower income, who perhaps qualify for some other federal program, um, three squares, or uh, maybe they've qualified for some sort of heating assistance. We're, we're looking at all of those different programs. We don't want our folks to have to look at your income. We want somebody to be able to say, hey, I qualify for this other program, and thereby qualify for any program, any discount that we might provide. Um, but Suffice to say, there's a whole suite of things that we are looking at now, and we may start putting them into buckets as to what we're able to do now and what we want to do for the future, and then we're going to be bringing that to the city council. Right. Uh, we have five more minutes, yep. so if you are able to make uh, this questions. Is the, this is the last, yeah. So, and I don't need to go through the schedule, just to know that this is the first bit, to make sure you guys are aware of the project, to take your ideas, if there's things that you think we're missing based on this material. Um, we want to hear from you as we move forward because uh, we are trying to bring something to the city council in February, at which point we would come back to the MPAs and share with you the results of the study. So I will take questions. Thank yeah. you for the time. Keeping. Great. Yes? Uh, you very accurately monitor the water coming into a residence, correct? Correct. Do you monitor the gray water and black water going out? We do not. So it is common practice for water utilities to charge, <coughs> except for irrigation meters, to charge um, the amount of wastewater based on how much water you use. Uh, largely because it's very difficult to meter, uh, to flow meter wastewater, it's chunky, for lack of a better description. Um, and so it is, com <laughs> it, is common, it is common practice to do it that way. Uh, so I don't know if you have a follow-up question, but that, that is the nature of the beast. 
I, I have another another follow-up question. Uh, is there any plan to make the uh, digesters down on the waterfront uh, anaerobic instead of aerobic? So we, we don't currently have digesters. We have clarifiers and we have a uh, biologic, biological system. We had been, I will say, had been very excited, particularly because of BED and about the energy savings of looking at digesters. I would say it right now, I'm at a little bit of a standstill because of the PFAS issue, uh, PFAs issue, uh, because digesters do not break down PFAS. And so we, even if we made a reusable class A biosolid, which could be spread on the landscape until the state figures out how they are going to deal with the PFAS issue, we're kind of stuck um, on that, which is a huge budgetary issue for me because of the amount I'm spending managing biosolids right now. Right. Um, I would love to do a digester from like an environmental sustainability concept, um, but right now the policy is not lining up with us being able to do that. Like, actually, we're probably encouraged to put it in the landfill, which breaks my heart. So, two comments: Are you testing for PFAS? Is one question. The other question is: I understand this. The state doesn't charge when a uh, spring water extraction operation and bottling operation takes place. It would seem as if you should argue to the state that the state should capture money for that and then distribute it back to the municipalities. They don't know about the spring water capture. Um, it might get hard. It might get complicated into which groundwater shed you're in because if nobody's withdrawing spring water from our groundwater shed, do we really have the rights to that money? But it'd be definitely something to look at um, as far as maybe putting it into a grant fund you know, for water infrastructure elsewhere. Uh, to answer your other question, PFAS, we have had PFAS testing on our wastewater effluent, influent, and I think our, uh, the sludge, and there are small, there are small amounts. It doesn't come from the wastewater treatment plant. We're a receiving station. It comes from industries and things that are coming into the wastewater treatment plant, and there is not currently a good way to strip it out before it goes out to the lake. We did just recently have PFAS testing on our drinking water, and I am happy to say that that was non-detect. Um, it is, it's a new issue. The detection limits have dropped, and so the stuff that really has always been around, we now know where it is, but nobody quite knows what to do with it, and so it is quite the quandary that we are in um, as we figure out a way of, of dealing with it in an environmentally sustainable way. Does that answer your question? Okay. Yep. Yeah, uh, California faced, of course, all the water restrictions and put in place all kinds of conservation uh, mechanisms for residential mm -hmm. um, housing. What are the options for Burlington, and where where is the greatest waste in residential uh, usages of water? That, that is a great question. I will say that because we don't really suffer from the water shortage thing, conservation has never really been a big, a huge priority for us. Um, I, that that should and can change because if we can conserve and drop flows on the way on the water side, it will help us regain some of our capacity on the wastewater side. So I'm starting to look at it from that perspective. Um, I think one of the best places that would sort of like uh, I never like to kill two birds with one stone, whatever that metaphor is. Um, that would take care of multiple things at the same time would be using storm water to flush toilets. If you're capturing storm water so that it doesn't go into the combined sewer system and you're holding on to it and then you're using like the fact that we flush our waste with drinking water makes me crazy. Um, so that's the one that usually frequently comes to mind. It's you know if you're on the cusp of innovation, people don't it get people get nervous about it. So I'm not up to speed on exactly how you do it and and whatnot. We I think we looked at it with the why and I can't remember if they ended up. Uh, they're not flushing, yeah. So we, we bring it up all the time and people get excited about it and then it seems like it's a code issue or probably a bureaucratic red tape, but that would be the best place that would do the most good. Um, or, or, using, or using rain barrels for uh, watering your garden, right? So unless you have a separate irrigation meter, if you withdraw water from a hose, we are still charging you that for wastewater even though it's going into the ground. That's why some people have done the calculation and done an irrigation meter. You should be collecting your rainwater and then using that to water your lawn because that's what it's there for. So, yep. One more question. 
And we're going to stick around afterwards, so if people have more water questions, we will talk water all night long. <laughs> okay. Um, I, am, I wanted to talk about the conservation aspect also, yep. because you said when people take a 10-minute shower, mm -hmm. it's only whatever, 47 cents or whatever you said. I was shocked that anyone would take a 10-minute shower, number one. And then you also said if people do less money, we still have the same carrying costs of, of administration, yep. which is... That's got to that's got to change because I've lived in tropical place. Mm -hmm. Water shortage. Yep. Over fifty percent of the people did not have access to water, and you're right. It's it's a it's a right, and, uh, and all we need to have is some real catastrophe in Lake Champlain, and there mm -hmm. goes the potability. No, no, I. I I, I do agree. My family lives in Cape Town, South Africa, and they came within thirty exactly. days of completely running out of water. Of water. So um, I'm surprised yes. that when you say conservation isn't mentioned, it should be because if you think oil wars have been bad, wait till you see water wars. Oh no, and that, that's why I think it's on our radar now. I'm saying that for however many years, uh, I think it hadn't mm. been on Burlington's focal point because we weren't necessarily facing some of the issues we are with Lake Champlain. I think people could have forecast them, but I think they're more in our face. And so uh, as, as part of this, you'll see there are some things on there about conservation. We have leak detection kits um, in the back, little tablets you can put in your back of your toilet tank. Because a lot of times toilets are the silent leakers. If you put the tablet in and you see uh, coloration in your bowl, that means that some part of your toilet is slowly leaking. And that I could get be it, but I'm yep. talking about climate change and I'm talking yep. about we have one source since we don't yep. get it from our groundwater at this yes. point. Yep, no, I agree. She is, she is a very good water source, but it doesn't mean that, she, that Lake Champlain will always be, be a, such a good water source. So um, thank you for your time. And like I said, we'll, we'll stick around for after the next session. And if anybody has more questions, we're happy to take them. We are going to wrap up with, um, last but not at all least, given the news uh, of the week, um, we're going to uh, have a school district update with uh, Claire Wool, our school board president, and Jeff Wick, school board committee member. So come on up. You guys have about 20 minutes. Hopefully leave some time for questions, because I know people are going to have them. Oh, <laughs> Boy, Megan's a tough act to follow. Yeah. <laughs> Great job. You make water and wastewater interesting. <laughs> <laughs> Jeff, you're gonna, someone's going to have to hold it. you got to hold it. Close. And the promotional materials you brought tonight just puts us to shame. What did we bring? Thanks. Oh, sorry. We're always trying to compete with BED, so that was really fun. So tonight um, we wanted to talk about an update with the BHS and BTC re-envisioning um, and answer questions, most importantly, uh, and then also talk about the um, news yesterday that uh, Superintendent of Obang will uh, complete this school year, but will is resigning and not. Claire, could you hold the mic right up to sure. your mouth so we can hear better? Uh, great. So I'll start first with our BHS BTC uh, re-envisioning. So the first message, loud and clear, is we are not over budget. We have not spent um, any money uh, with regards to construction costs. Um, and in speaking with the uh, city council's uh, department of finance and conducting our own, we call it our, our, our monthly uh, BCOC construction meetings that we have to the public. This is an estimate. So our estimate, we are in the design stage, the schematic design stage. Um, and right now we are reconciling scope and development. But in any project, and it's new to me, um, so I'm learning as I go, but I am with very competent people. Um, the schematic design is we approached it once the bond was passed on the conceptual drawings. Uh, we knew that going into um, January and meeting with all the stakeholders, being faculty, staff, community, um, we presented uh, it as a wish list. What, how, how do you want to re-envision VHS and VTC? 
Um, and so we spent many um, months and weeks with students, teachers, faculty, staff, um, to come up with the design with, within reach with Black River Design um, and worked uh, diligently for efficiencies, safety, um, and accessibility on the property. The um, square footage of the property um, remained, roughly we're, we're looking at 280,000 square feet. Um, that includes both buildings on the campus. Um, but we took a, 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 a view of you know, our wish list and what we would like to do within that, the confines of that budget, the bonded um, amount. Um, of late, when we presented the schematic design uh, for, for estimating in August, it came back with um, unforeseen, unfavorable uh, seismic conditions that we had spent time and money um, to evaluate the soil. Um, asbestos scope and scale greater than anticipated. Um, and uh, we understand that the real world, world costs, even a year later, um, some of the estimates were you know, double than what originally was um, presented when Black River Design did their estimating and where we mm. come up with 70 million. So the goal here is we have $70 million to make this campus uh, and improve this campus better. And we, that is what our, we are tasked to do. We're not looking to ask for more money. So it involves being creative and at the same time understanding and educating the public what our current competition is with regards to construction and construction costs, square footage costs. So the next step is yesterday we saw a uh, uh, next iteration of the campus uh, and we will present to BHS BTC faculty on Tuesday, this coming Tuesday the 12th. We will also um, present it to, at the school board meeting Tuesday night uh, and we will have as always our monthly meeting on November 21st for the public to come to BHS. It's the third Thursday of the month at 6.30. Um, to educate them as well, so anyone interested in, in becoming more involved or educated in it. Um, we also have all our updates on our website, uh, BSV, B, uh, BT, um, and um, we'll answer any questions after, but uh, the news, the initial news was depressing, of course, um, but it, depressing in a way the, of the reality of construction costs, but the estimation, um, for example, uh, when you're estimating a project this size, for example, I just want to share is the HVAC system for the campus. It was estimated at $20 million just for the HVAC system. Um, and it's drilling down those details and those contingencies within those estimates um, is, you know, what does the campus need? Does it need the most high-end HVAC system, the middle of the road? Um, or the most, you know, the efficient for the best, you know, price. So based on your own home renovation costs, um, you know, that's where we're looking to uh, maximize our bond dollars. Um, so I am, like I said, our, our, our goal is our OPR requirements, um, our, you know, accessibility, safety, and efficiency. And so we will accomplish those uh, within that $70 million and the design, you know, what we sold, the sold, I, I hate the, what you invested in, in in approving the bond was, you know, not only will it be a curbside appeal, it will look attractive, um, but the most importantly, what I didn't, when I went into the soils, the wrapping around, the original idea to wrap around the building from the gymnasium uh, south, like the North Beach side, coming around to the auditorium. We are no longer going to wrap around the south side of the building that would look out onto Buckhard Field, the athletic fields. The soils there, uh, the soil there would not um, be able to uh, with, withhold the weight of a four-story building. And that was our original thought. We had actually done preliminary soil testings all around the east, north, and west side of the building, and not the south. So just unfortunate. And we felt as a district spending dollars in the ground, you know, five stories or four stories down to have um, any bearing would be um, 
money ill spent that we should look towards the ledge side of the building um, which is the east side um, and look at adding the, the needed um, square footage on the east side and so the east side is the north avenue side of the building so I'm confident uh, that this is you know we're on the right path um, and yes troubling as it sounded that's a reality and uh, not to be Debbie Downer we you know when you look at this campus and the potential it does make me a little sad to think that we are designing and improving this campus based on the number that we were able to seek for a bond and the estimating so you know for example South Burlington or other school districts having spent a year sort of researching in Massachusetts is you know without any conceptual drawings towns go after uh, bonds and so we you know we have put ourselves in this position where we are going to get the most out of 70 million dollars um, but that might mean use utilizing more of the same space and renovating it rather than new construction and that's okay because it'll be a lot better than what it currently is so the upside is it there is massive room for improvement and 70 million dollars I look forward to seeing what that what that buys us. Um, is there any? Do you want to answer questions about the the renovation first, and then we'll go into? Why don't we go through whatever topics we want to hit, and then take questions maybe at the end? Because right, we great. might get mired okay, in yeah, that. Great. Oh yeah, right. Good idea. All right. So Jeff, you want to speak? Or I can speak without the superintendent. Yeah, go right ahead. So um, we were notified uh, uh, on Monday of the superintendent's desire to. Um, resign after this school year and so uh, he sent out a press release uh, to the public and it's been all over the news and um, we wish him well and we are appreciative of his leadership over the past five years and um, we immediately Jeff and I met today with our director of HR um, and I also had the good fortune of meeting with Secretary of uh, Education today Dan French um, who will assist us in this uh, really important role to fill uh, and I'm looking forward to um, the work ahead and the recruitment uh, to retain someone who would be lucky enough to work here in Burlington. So that's our outlook is that we're immediately looking for a, uh, you know, a, a recruiting for a superintendent. So the search has begun uh, starting today, the work. So. And a couple other perhaps less flashy things that I'd like to say is um, the negotiations have commenced with the teachers union for the contract that begins um, in July. Uh, we've got a fair amount of time on that, but you may all know that uh, I think it was last year the legislature passed a law that has, is in the process of taking a portion of the bargaining out of the local hands and into the state level. And what I mean by that is health care is now being bargained at the state level. It's statewide. So that's one thing that's kind of an interesting twist in this particular teacher's contract negotiation cycle. Uh, that will be out of our hands. Right now, we don't know what it'll look like. So it might take us a little longer than it did last year to come to a, an agreement uh, with the teachers because we're waiting to see what the, te the health, statewide health care is going to look like for um, actually all employees in, in public schools in Vermont. So that's one piece that's out there. What else is going on? You know, there's a seasonality to this whole business. And we are just getting into full swing with uh, the annual budgeting process. In fact, I believe our, our regular meeting, which is next Tuesday, we're going to have some more meet, if you will, to uh, start digging into regarding what will our budget look like next year. I believe posted on the school district's website is a list of uh, public input opportunities. Um, I couldn't recite them right now, but uh, you can always email me and I'll send you that list or a link. But uh, among others, next Wednesday, I'm sorry, next Tuesday and the Tuesday after that, the board meets. So you're always welcome to come. Typically it's at VHS at 6 p.m., public comment. But I'm very hopeful that we will, we will uh, do our very, very best to keep uh, your taxes uh, from increasing in any painful way. I think we did a pretty good job last year balancing 
Uh, we did add a few things. I did my calculations when the tax bill came out in July. It was in the 4% range on the education piece of the tax bill. So I was pretty pleased with that because we ended up getting a lot of value out of that. We added a number of um, kindergarten paraeducators to the kindergarten classrooms, which were sorely needed. These kindergartners, as you know, are very, very young, just entering uh, school, and the ratio of uh, students to teacher is pretty darn high in the 20s to 1. Mm -hmm. And a few years ago, under budget pressures, the district had to cut or chose to cut all the kindergarten paraeducators. So you've got your, you've got your school teacher in there with a large group of varying needs. Anyway, I'm so pleased we were at the, able to fa we're phasing that in over a couple of years. Uh, there are a few other examples, but uh, I think we, we ba I think we balanced some additions to costs well, and I hope we will be very sensitive to that again this year. And then so the can other, we, can we pause for questions? Just see, we've only got five oh, minutes. Sorry. Left. Unless it's very crucial, what you were about mm. to say. Uh, one very quick thing. Okay. As was, you might know, okay. we have a number of new principals in our elementary schools. I'm hearing very, very good things. Um, it seems like it's been very calming, hearing positive things, which is very important. That sets a climate, as you know, from the, the top down. It sets a, yeah. So anyway, I guess I'll back to Claire, and then we'll take your questions. Yeah. Very mundane question. Uh, walking by Edmonds Middle School, Regularly, I notice cars have been parked on the grass. Mm -hmm. Yesterday, there were six cars in the afternoon parked on the grass. What's the reason for that? So we, yes, we have addressed that. Right now, we are um, working with uh, Marty Spaulding, our property services. Uh, we had some reduced parking in the back because of the construction, um, and there just doesn't seem to be an ample space. So we are figuring out with the with the um, uh, the um, other, the elementary school principal doing an inventory of, it's just, I don't want to say lack of organization, that we have to get a, a stronger uh, hold on permitting in the staff lot. And so we've had some student teachers and, and um, additional parkers, uh, people parking in the parking lot, so we've outgrown it, so we have to address it. So it's been brought up a lot because um, not only yourself, but other neighbors have asked why they're parking on there. Would it, would it be possible to stake out the drip circle of the trees there so that the cars aren't compacting the soil and doing permanent damage to the trees? I will bring that up to them. That's a great idea. Are they um, just traffic enforcement um, ticketing those cars? No, we've asked them not to because the, the part of it was we didn't have, uh, it was on a neat basis, so it's not, the people that are parking there are not teachers that are working there all day. It's staff coming in. And we've had some a couple of uh, issues that have needed uh, people to come down on a moment's notice. And that has been the only place where they have been able to park. And But it's getting more comfortable. So we've, we've asked them to address it. Well, you're lucky that they granted that exception. Yeah. It's related to cars. Um, my recollection from last year is that there is a plan to cease the practice of pickup uh, 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 at the side of the middle school which backs up the cars on South Union but where there, where there is like a whole line of no parking signs but like today there, there literally were probably 20 cars that went more than a block and a half back so is is this is something under construction still that's going to change that that's going to be done no there will always be that that problem on South Union Street. Um, there was a study done by uh, uh, Peggy Bronco and um, the, the bike organization in the city uh, to actually add a, a bike lane, and that did not go over well because of the narrowness of uh, between King Street and, and Maple Street. Um, and really, you know, the the, the issue is that um, you know we could look into a curb cut uh, and. It's, it's something that needs to get addressed. Last year, two years ago, they talked about putting a road through the Edmonds campus, mm -hmm. and that was met with um, much resistance because that's the only <coughs> field. I know we have the large field above, but it's really used for the elementary school, and so the middle school green space is just that, that area. Um, and so uh, it's an issue. So, uh, you know, again, bringing it to our attention, we'll, I will have to touch base with Marty and Meg McDonough, the principal, but 
There's a, um, when I was driving today, that you have the driveway that comes down out yes. of the back of the school, there's a little uh, faded crosswalk there, but yes. no lights, no nothing. Cars are parked there, and a kid came out between two cars, right? And, I mean, I stopped, thank God. But, I mean, no visibility until that kid was practically in the middle no, of the street. You, you remind me, it, had, it has to be a jet. Thank you. Yeah. I'm, I'm glad we're talking about this. It makes sense to close that block for two hours every afternoon. <laughs> that would be. Or they talk about not having resident parking on the um, left-hand side. Yes, on the, on the west, west side. But that we, we, we tried to tackle that uh, five years ago, and it was not because it's hard to at an all-time high. So, can I just say one thing? Thanks for being so transparent regarding the high school and the budget. I mean, you're right, a $70 million opportunity to upgrade the high school is, is an exciting opportunity. Yes. Even if it's not what we envision, it's going to be fantastic. And also, along that line, so, um, what about the timetable? Has that changed? I or? Like as that. Thank you, Mary. Yes, so we are looking at 20, originally we had thought the summer of 2020, but we will now be a year out because within the six months that we've sort of lost this August to now uh, and permitting as it is, it would be a 2021 project starting in 2021. Great. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Just to piggyback on that issue with um, South Union, I rely on that to ride with my kids on the bike to IA because it connects with the bike lane. Yeah. And it's quite a disaster mm -hmm. because we either end up riding on the road, which is fairly dangerous because it's so chaotic, or we ride on the sidewalk, which we have a conflict with the students. So when you said that it will stay like this, this is pretty discouraging. And there are clearly signs that cars are not supposed to stop there yeah. anyway. So um, just as, as a people, I know this is not really your issue, no. it's more the city, but I think the source of the problem is the school and the behavior of the parents that feel that's the only way they can drop their kids out. You know, it is a cultural, uh, you know, we are in suburbia, so we don't have numbers like placards in our car to pick up our kids like most suburban towns. Um, and Edmonds is our most city school. Mm -hmm. So we have an incredible challenge of even getting substitutes at that campus. So think of it, we have over a thousand students on that campus and you know, times I would say 70 <coughs> teachers, and we cannot get substitutes because they say there's no parking, I'm not working for your school. And so everybody is challenged, and even during construction, I went through the city and showed them you know, parking, the ample parking, um, and so it is an issue that we definitively have to do, and it takes bodies to actually educate. I mean, we talked about we had parent volunteers that would man the horseshoe at the elementary side. We've never had parent parent volunteers manage the middle school side, but you know, at the time of the day, three o'clock, if we can get volunteer parents, but it's a pretty ugly position to put someone in. Like you can't stop here. And where do they pick up? You know, where do you meet your kids? I think it's a design issue. It's not. It's it's not going to happen. Education, yeah, education and design. So like, you know, people had talked about putting a horseshoe in front of Edmonds Middle School, similar to BHS, that you create the horseshoe and then you create the log jam. But even now, there's sometimes, there are no cars parked at that 15 minute, it's a, it's a convenient thing. Yes. People do not want to drive around there. Mm -hmm. And even going through the parking lot in the back, is because I ride my bike yes. through there. It, there's often absolutely no traffic in there. So, so I don't I don't buy it quite on the drop off that that it's an issue of not having enough capacity. Mm -hmm. I think it's an issue of Convenience. attitude and yeah. of convenience. I agree. I agree. Well, I, I will bring this. They have a very very active PTO. I was the PTO chair there for many years, and um, they have a, a, an active group of parents. And I think it always it needs to be addressed. I appreciate everyone's feedback because it's important. Joke. Hi there. So hopefully solution. Um, I mean, we heard from Champlain College. We hear from the universities. Maybe it's time for the Burlington School District to think about a shuttle for some of the permanent employees. I mean, you have space down at facilities. I don't know what you have up on the hill. It seems pretty packed up there. But maybe even going with the, um, I know that there's been some partnership with Champlain over the field at Edmonds. Maybe you can partner with that parking lot down off from Pine Street with them. Uh, the price of a bus, and granted, you, your subs probably won't, 
but a lot of the longtime people that live in this area would certainly. And if we're talking in Burlington, you know, let's start, let's, let's piggyback off from them and get a shuttle. I, I know that you can't use the special ed buses because of special ed money, but certainly, you know, we can afford something to, to, to fix a problem up there. So that, that's smart. a thought. Yeah. Um, number two is, um, I feel your pain on the construction. You know, we have so many projects going on in the city. There's no help statewide. So, you know, everybody pretty much, you know, has, a, has an open check for construction. I feel your pain. You know, we we're doing some bathrooms up at Mount Abe. We thought we're going to go one eight and now two six. So I, I get it. Um, and so I, I feel it. And I, I we I, I think in the room that we all have confidence that, you know, with the board that we have, that we're going to get a pretty good product for seventy million dollars. So Thank you very much. That means a lot. So what, the, and, and I don't want to be the elephant in the room, but everybody wants to know if the superintendent's going to get paid that extra money when he resigns or is when he leaves, is that it for him? I know that the free press talked a little bit about it, but nobody's talking about it, so. Right. Um, I, I think we aren't at liberty to speak to that yet. However, uh, eventually, I think what, whatever, well, so he obviously notified the community mm -hmm. and the public of his intention to wrap up the year mm -hmm. and then explore new opportunities. Um, he, he's under contract to do yet another year, so the board has to um, ratify that, and that's part of what we'll be doing, uh, we believe, next next week. Tuesday. Uh, Tuesday. And um, so eventually, I got to think that um, th there'll be more information on point. So mm -hmm. I, I'm just asking for perhaps some, okay. some patience, but. Uh, because right, I mean, you'll eventually uh, the, the, the taxpayers will know what the bargain is, but uh, what the situation is. But I think it's premature right now. Did, uh, I didn't read That's anywhere if he's staying in the area. Do you know that? Uh, we do not. Um, that we would leave to him to uh, talk about. All right. I think we're going to wrap. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Uh,